Hello and welcome to summarize the points that were covered in the previous lecture. We covered the presence of cell surface markers on B cells, T cells as well as macrophages and how antibodies that are specific to these cell surface proteins could be generated and the use of these antibodies to identify cells expressing these molecules using immunofluorescence. And we also went into the role of the major histocompatibility antigens in self and non-self distinction or recognition. And this involved the establishment of homozygosity for the breeding of the inbred strains of mice which were so essential to look at self and non-self distinction. This breeding of inbred strains of mice had the principle of the probability of fixing or becoming homozygous given by the form by this formula that is indicated over here and which also indicated that if brother sister mating was done for a pair of mice for over 20 generations then their genome would essentially become homozygous. Going to some examples of inbred strains of mice and how they are represented which is represented in this slide and this indicates the different strain names given over here and the common names as it is usually known by. Incidentally the common white mouse that you see in most animal houses the bulb C mouse which are used mainly to make monoclonal antibodies and other experiments and the coat color which is also a distinguishing feature of these breeding experiments. Now, the H 2 haplotype is, go, is given over here and the way the genotype so far as the histocompatibility or the immune responses are concerned is written as H dash 2 and the superscript is represented by a small uh, alphabet like in this case B and this haplotype is indicated over here for all these strains of mice. For example, A and AKR has K incidentally this has to be in small it is not caps it is small small k likewise in these two cases also. So, you have it written as H 2 and to the H 2 the superscript being the alphabet. So, for different mice it is a different alphabet all it indicates is that that these different mice have a different sequence of genes in their H 2 complex. Now, the members of each inbred strain are homozygous within each strain or if we take over here these white mice represented here and the black mice represented over here between these mice all their haplotype is the same that means they are all homozygous and they are said to be an inbred strain. Whereas, when compared to the black mouse and the white mouse you will see that the sequence of genes are very different at the MHC locus. So, you have the entire genotype being different between different strains of mice as indicated by this colored mice over here. Now, once they recognized that these were inbred strains of mice, they could reproducibly do experiments involving skin graft or transplantation experiments which is shown in this slide over here. So, skin grafts that were exchanged between in the same mice or the same inbred strains were accepted. Skin grafts that were grafted on to a, a different strain of mice, a donor being the one that is giving the skin graft or donating the skin graft and the recipient being the one that is receiving the skin graft. As in this case, this graft survives for about 10 to 14 days after which that piece of skin becomes dry, the circulation is cut off and the piece of skin drops off. So, we refer to it as being the graft being rejected. This they have noticed is during this graft rejection when they look at the morphology of lymphocytes as was co covered in the 
in the class involving different types of cells of the immune system, they underwent morphological changes indicating the participation of immune cells in this process of graft rejection. Incidentally, if the same mouse was grafted again with the same piece of skin from the same inbred strain of mouse, you would find that there would be an accelerated rejection reminding you that it could be an immunological phenomena where a memory response was involved. Also, if lymphoid cells were transferred from this recipient to a naive recipient of the same strain and the graft grafted onto the back again, you would see the same accelerated rejection of the skin reminding you that these are experiments or results that would be seen in immunological experiments, where one would see a primary and an immune primary and a secondary immune response. And when, when an antigen is injected for the first time, you would see a prim primary response, this is the immune response and on the x axis you would have the time. When the antigen is exposed again to this immune system, you would see a heightened response which is called the memory response or the secondary response, which is what is happening during the accelerated reje uh, rejection of the skin graft indicating that this rejection of skin graft was in fact immune mediated. Now, once several inbred strains of mice became available and the suggestion of the immune responses being involved in the skin graft rejection or the histocompatibility reaction, experiments were dedicated to anti sera generation between inbred strains of mice. For example, you could immunize the spleen cells or the lymphocytes that were taken from one strain and in this case as an example a white strain which is which is denoted here as strain A and injected into the into the strain B mouse which is indicated by a black mouse here and after a certain period of time after booster booster injections one would see the presence of antibodies against strain A in the blood of these mice and these antibodies would actually recognize a strain A specific antigen. In other words, it was possible to generate strain specific anti sera by cross immunizing these mice. Similarly, the injection of the black mouse or the strain B mouse with the splenocytes or lymphocytes taken from the other strain or the strain A would generate anti, anti sera or antibodies that would specifically react to the cells derived from the black mouse. So, in other words this strain specific anti sera generation made it possible for immunologists to see the presence of the expression of this so called self specific antigen. In fact, serology is such a complex field involving the cross immunization of these different strains of mice. In fact, when all these different strains of mice were immunized with the splenocytes taken from each other, you would get antibodies that would be specific not only for different, different kinds of strains that means a common determinant that was spread across different strains which is called as the public specificity. So, these anti sera recognized determinants that were shared by different alleles at the same locus or same or different alleles at different loci. Now, this will become clear as we look at the MHC complex in later lectures. A private specificity on the other hand had the ability to recognize an unique determinant for that particular strain or for the particular type of MHC or locus in that particular inbred strain of mouse. So, in fact, the number of sera that could be generated would actually come be, could be calculated by this formula, where you have 2 to the power n minus 2, where the, the n is the number of inbred strains involved in these cross immunization studies. 
Suffice it to say that these serology experiments involving the cross immunization of inbred strains of mice with their uh, splenocytes or lymphocytes made it possible to generate antibodies or anti-seda that could specifically recognize these inbred strains of mice in terms of an antigen or a determinant that would be expressed on protein antigens on the cell surface. In addition, these anti-sera had antibodies that could recognize common antigens that would be distributed across the different strains. Coming now to some definitions that are arising from these transplantation experiments and immunological experiments. One is the inbred strain as we have we are we are now referring to the generation of inbred strain of mouse. It could be defined as a mouse strain whose individual members possess homozygous chromosomes with the exception of the y chromosome because it is a male the difference it is the it represents the difference between the male and the female. And these strains actually produce identical homozygous progeny when mated with each other. Now, during the grafting experiments these are the definitions involved being syngraft which is a transplant of tissue from one member of a species to another genetically identical member of the same species. So, in other words this grafting has to take place between members of the same inbred strain. As opposed to a syn, a syn graft an isograft is a transplant between different parts within the same individual or member of that or, or member of that inbred strain of mouse. Genetically identical members of the same species are termed as being syngeneic to each other. The term allograft on the other hand represents the transplant of tissue from one member of a species to another genetically distinct member of the same species. Genetically distinct members of the same species are said to be allogenic to each other. So, therefore, the terms syngraft and allograft have to do with the genetically identical members of the same species or genetically distinct members of the same species. The xenograft on the other hand is the transplant of tissue from one member of a species to another genetically distinct member of a different species. So, genetically distinct members of different species are referred to as being xenogenic to each other. So, continuing with some points that needs to be known is the term polymorphic. Now, the generation of these inbred strains of mice and the concept that these inbred strains of mice actually expressed different alleles of the same locus on the cell surface brought out the point that these strain specific antisera actually indicated the presence of cell surface antigens that elicited them as being highly polymorphic. That is several alternative forms of the gene or the protein referred to as alleles for the genes exist for each locus or antigen. And that all these loci which were termed as the major histocompatibility complex since these were discovered by histocompatibility experiments or uh, graft transplantation experiments. These loci are closely linked that is the recombination frequency within these genes is very very small of the order of 0.5 percent. This resulted in the observation that all these alleles encoded by these loci are inherited as two sets one from each parent one from the father and one from the mother. And these alleles which are closely linked which are which are inherited as a set is actually called as a haplotype. So, the haplotype is defined as each closely linked set of alleles that are inherited is called a haplotype. This haplotype essentially and crudely speaking represents 
the genetic sequence of the or the nucleotide sequence in the genes that are involved and therefore, being different between different inbred strains of mice. And when a superscript is written for the mice as H 2 B, this alphabet actually represents a certain nucleotide sequence for these genes, which will which will be different in a different inbred strain of mouse, which which may be having a D haplotype. Going on further, the term codominancy refers to the fact that these antigens are genes or genes are expressed in a codominant fashion. Both the maternal and paternal gene derived proteins are expressed on the same cell. Now, we are referring to the MHC locus. In outbred populations, the progeny are heterozygous. Whereas, in inbred strains the maternal and paternal H 2 loci are homozygous, because their haplotypes or genetic sequence at the H 2 locus is identical. Therefore, the MHC molecules that they express within inbred strains or members of the same inbred strain will have an identical structure, both primary, secondary, tertiary as well as quaternary. Now, when it is an outbred strain of mouse or in heterozygous populations like in like in human populations, you have both the maternal and paternal MHC gene derived antigens or protein molecules on, on the cell surface. Incidentally, it has to be pointed out that since these serology experiments involved the cross immunization of uh, spleen cells and the antibodies generated were said to recognize a particular determinant on an antigen that is expressed on the cell surface derived from these inbred strains. The, ant the term antigen was also used for the MHC molecule and therefore, when, when uh, there are descriptions involving the major histocompatibility complex, you will see in textbooks that it is referred to as the MHC antigen. This does not mean that this, this is always used as an antigen, but the term became associated with the MHC uh, molecule. And the term antigen can also be used for other protein molecules, which are uh, being immunized into different kinds of animals. So, going on further, you find that the generation of inbred strains of mice led to mice that are having different genotypes or different haplotypes, but this haplotype actually represented the sequence or the nucleotide sequence across all the chromosomes. There was no specific locus or no specific region that was identified within all these different chromosomes as being responsible for the skin graft rejection. And therefore, experiments were done in order to find out or try to locate a locus that would be responsible for the skin graft rejection reactions that were that, that they were observing. And this could be done by the same inbreeding strain inbreeding experiments that, that, that were shown to you earlier. Conceptually just to indicate to you what congenic resistant locus means. The word congenic means difference only at one locus. And, there, and when you are following the major histocompatibility locus, this had to be the locus that determined skin graft rejection. And resistant or the word resistant meaning pertaining to the MHC, because one was referring to the resistance or acceptance of skin graft. So, therefore, when you look at these two uh, representations over here, one being the brown and one being put in the black, this being C standing for the centromere. These are all the different uh, loci that are used as markers, which are around this particular region that determines the uh, skin graft rejection, which as I referred to you in the last in, in the previous slide as the H 2. Now, T L A stands for thymic leukemic antigen and T F stands for transferrin and so on and so forth. What is shown in purple over here is the map units or the recombination units in centimorgans. 
So, when you look at the black and, and, and the brown lines, you will see that they are different across the entire chromosome. So, you look at mouse chromosome 17, which is where the H 2 is located. One had to have mice that were different only at the H 2 locus in order to say that this difference is what is causing the skin graft rejection. The H 2 locus further is subdivided into sub loci. There are two types of MHC molecules or H 2 molecules called as the class 1 and class 2. Class 1 loci being represented by the K gene and the D gene and the class 2 antigens being expressed from the I gene I A as well as I E. So, there are two sub loci in this class 2 locus. And then you have the S region which is the class 3 MHC molecule which is not pertaining to this lecture. So, how did one derive mice or generate, generate mice that were different only at this particular locus. So, in order to do that we need to find out what sort of breeding experiments were done in order to generate these type of congenic resistant mouse strains. This involved the interbreeding and cross breeding of these uh, mice including in interbreeding as well as back crossing to the parental strain. So, as you see in this slide two inbred strains were taken and they were mated to get the heterozygous F 1. These heterozygous uh, mice were brother sister mated in order to get this ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, A A being homozygous and B B being homozygous and A B being heterozygous. Now, these pups that were there in the in the cage were mated back to the parental strain A, a mouse. The assay that was used during all these inbred strains of mice was the ability of these mice or the F 1 and F 2 generations to reject a piece of skin derived from the parent that they were back crossing it to. In other words that these mice had to reject the strain A skin graft. As you will see here only the black mouse which is homozygous would reject the A strain skin graft and these heterozygous uh, progeny as well as the homozygous A strain would actually accept this A strain skin graft. Now, using this assay as the assay to follow the generation of these mice during the breeding experiments, they continuously back crossed these heterozygous mice to the strain A skin graft. So, after this one uh, strain A back cross, they went about doing the intercrossing again, they got the next, next cycle where they back crossed it to the A strain parent all the time <coughs> assaying them for the ability to reject the strain A skin graft. And therefore, as you saw in the, in the previous slides the uh, as the principle of the formula suggests doing this, this cycle more than about uh, 10 to 15 cycles would generate a mouse that would become homozygous to the parent which is A. But on the other hand you, you were always picking mice that were that were had that were having the ability to reject the strain A skin graft and therefore, it that would remain the haplotype that had the ability to be different from the strain A parent. So, these congenic resistant mice are having the same sequence everywhere except for the H 2 locus. Now, after having generated these congenic resistant strains of mice, they found that since these were known to be immunologically related uh, phenomena, they mixed these splenocytes together to see what would be the result. <coughs> So, taking congenic resistance strains in other words these congenic resistance strains were different only at the H 2 complex or the MHC uh, locus which was the locus that determined skin graft rejection. So, you had two types of assays what was called as the mixed lymphocyte reaction as the name suggests they mix these two kinds of splenocytes together from these two congenic resistant inbred strains of mice and they found that these two splenocytes would react against each other. 
this reaction could be followed because there was the consequence of this mixing was proliferation and this proliferation could be followed by tritiated thymidine incorporation into the DNA of these cells. So, therefore, these two strains of uh, splenocytes would recognize each other and proliferate. On the other hand, they made this assay a little more simpler to follow it, where they took one, one of these strains of mice, it is called as the stimulator, because they were used to stimulate the responding cells. They treated them with irradi they irradiated these cells, so they destroyed their ability to proliferate or treated them with a drug called mitomycin C, which would again block proliferation by, in, by uh, incorporating into the DNA. And this would then result in stimulating the responding cells. So, when you measure the thymidine incorporation, this would give an indication of how the responding spleen cells were proliferating. So, these were the different kinds of assays, in, they, would, uh, they would do the assay in reverse. And so, they could have a one way MLR setup for different kinds of inbred strains of mice. During this one way mixed lymphocyte reaction, which is usually done for a period of 3 to 5 days, two different uh, kinds of results are noticed. And one is the thymidine incorporation as I we just now gone through. Now, during this culture for 5 days, there also results a differentiation of killer cells in this mixture. So, this these killer cells when they are exposed to or brought in contact with the cells that were stimulating them would actually kill them. So, these killer cells that had differentiated during this mixed lymphocyte reaction would actually engage the target cells, these target cells being derived from the same haplotype as that of the stimulator cells. These these targets could either be just spleen cells that had been treated with a mitogen. So, they, they had become bigger in size or they could be tumor cells that had been derived from such mice or having or bearing the same uh, haplotype or expressing the same MHC antigen on their cell surface. So, the differentiated killer cells would recognize that particular MHC antigen and kill them resulting in lysis of these target cells and the contents being released to the outside. In addition to which apoptosis or, or apoptosis had or, or was also induced in these cells which means that the DNA was being fragmented. Now, this assay could easily be followed by a radioactive chromium 51 release assay. The targets were labeled with chromium radioactive chromium 51 which we taken up actively and kept inside in essentially be becoming a balloon of chromium 51 and when the killer punched a hole into these cells, this chromium 51 would be released and one, would, one could calculate the percent killing. Why is this important? These two assays were very important in, in establishing the presence of the sub loci that was, that was seen in the H 2 complex. As you see here, this is the slide that I showed you earlier in which two inbred congenic resistant inbred strains of mice were differing only at the H 2 complex and the other regions including the other chromosomes had the same sequence. Now, this H 2 complex which was different referring to the difference uh, presence uh, pre presence of difference between congenic resistant inbred strains of mice also was represented as having two types of MHC as I alluded to, to you earlier and that is the presence of the class 1 antigens being the K and D and the class 2 antigens being the I region. Now, these two assays were instrumental in discovering this sort of uh, difference in the type of MHCs that were present. Now, to see how these how these were discovered again one has to go into how these different inbred strains of mouse mice were being mated and during this inbreeding process they found out that these mice had actually undergone an intra H 2 recombination although the this locus is very closely linked. So, these were rare events and therefore, the generation of these strains was also very rare these could be distinguished by their ability to reject 
versus except the sc uh, particular screen graft in the heterozygous mice. We will not go into the details of this for lack of time. It, suffice it to say that these are intra H2 recombinants and these are the different strains of mice that were generated 2R, 3R, 4R, 5R and 18R refers to the cycle second cycle, third cycle, fourth cycle and so on during which the uh, extremely meticulous record keeping um, by those experimenters demonstrated that these mice were actually different when they were subjected to these different assays of CTL as well as graft rejection and proliferation assays. So, you will see that the CTL reaction is associated between a difference in the class 1 locus. For example, the D antigen being different in these two strains caused a difference or a CTL activation phenomena cytotoxic T lymphocyte or a lytic assay becoming positive as opposed to the proliferation assay being positive in the strains of mice where the class 2 locus or the IE locus was different between the two different strains of mice. So, these are just examples where an intra H2 recombination had occurred and how these strains of mice were actually used to demonstrate that there were two types of MHC called as the MHC 1 and the MHC 2. MHC 1 always determined the outcome in CTL assays and the MHC 2 always determined the outcome in proliferation assays. In other words, a difference in the MHC locus led to a higher degree of proliferation whereas, a difference at the MHC 1 locus uh, led to a, a higher degree of CTL generation or killer cell generation. Therefore, the importance of recombinant inbred mouse strains that differed within the MHC locus showed the presence of these two different uh, uh, MHC types called as the MHC 1 and MHC 2. So, all these experiments that involved the CTL assays, the proliferation assays and especially the generation of um, mouse sera which had public specificity and private specificities enabled the um, use of these anti sera to show the presence of specific determinants or specific protein antigens that were present on the cell surface derived from these different inbred strains of mice expressing different uh, MHC molecules or MHC molecules that differed in their primary sequence. So, these anti sera then led to the led to experiments that involved the immunoprecipitation of these molecules uh, from uh, the different inbred strains of mice and the immunoprecipitation of these molecules actually helped in the purification or the affinity purification of these different MHC antigens that were different in different inbred strains of mice. And these purified antigens were then uh, subjected to amino acid sequencing in order to find out the primary amino acid sequence of these MHC antigens. And as I told you earlier, the um, uh, these amino acid sequences demonstrated that in fact, these MHC antigens were very polymorphic in nature. This polymorphism is different from the gene recombination that is seen in antibody molecules or immunoglobulin genes, where the variable region genes are um, taken out and juxtaposed to the constant region genes. There it is a it is a phenomena of gene recombination which results in different variable region uh, genes, but not the whole molecule being different in different cases and that the variable region genes had to be had to be uh, associated with the binding of the antigen. Therefore, uh, different different variable region genes had to be used during this uh, immunoglobulin gene rearrangement. The MHC uh, region being polymorphic the experiments demonstrated the structure of these MHC antigens was then uh, was then elucidated as being of the two types called as MHC 1 and MHC 2. So, the anti sera that were used to show this by immunoprecipitation experiment showed that MHC 1 specific anti sera actually brought down a heavy chain that is shown in this particular slide. This heavy chain can be divided into three domains called as the alpha 1, the alpha 2 
as well as the alpha 3 domains. These, these domains the alpha 2 and the alpha 3 domains are linked by disulfide bonds and there is a transmembrane region and a very short cytoplasmic region. This is the C terminal end of the molecule and this is the N terminal end of the molecule. This so called MHC or class 1 heavy chain is stabilized on the cell surface by another protein subunit called as the beta 2 microglobulin which is coded for by a different gene. This beta 2 microglobulin is bound to these domains by hydrophobic interactions and is itself not anchored within the membrane. Now, this these are also disulfide linked and as opposed to the polymorphic nature of the class 1 heavy chain the beta 2 microglobulin is in fact conserved across species. As opposed to the class 1 molecule you see that the class 2 molecule has got a different kind of a structure in that it has two protein subunits as the class 1 has, but the difference is that both the subunits are anchored into the membrane that is both the subunits have a transmembrane region and similar to the class 1 heavy chain both the subunits of the MHC 2 molecule have a short intracytoplasmic tail. These two, these two uh, protein subunits of the class 2 molecule have again two domains called as the alpha 1 and alpha 2 for the alpha subunit and the beta 1 and the beta 2 for the beta, uh, beta subunit of the class 2 uh, molecule. These two the alpha 2 and the beta 2 are linked by disulfide bonds and you see a disulfide bond here in the beta 1 subunit. As you will see in this figure this is represented in this particular fashion as having two alpha helices and a beta pleated floor and then having this particular structure because this is what is indicated by crystallography study crystallographic studies involving the purified molecule. In fact, early experiments involving the purification of these molecules uh, involved the use of the enzyme uh, uh, trip, uh, papain where there is a cleavage site over here because the papain release this molecule reminisces uh, uh, reminding us of the immunoglobulin molecules being cleaved by proteases in order to generate the different fragments. So, this particular uh, structure has actually been written in hindsight after seeing the x-ray crystallographic modeling studies and how, how this particular antigen is actually modeled. Now, looking at this particular structure you will see that this domain structure of alpha 2, alpha 1 and alpha 3 actually corresponds to the various exons that are present within the H 2 class 1 gene. This is an example of the H 2 K B locus and you will find as represented by the corresponding colors you find that the alpha 1 domain this is the protein uh, representation and this is the gene representation. So, you have the signal peptide followed by the, the uh, external domain 1 which codes for the alpha 1 domain. Then you have an intron and then the external domain 2 exon codes for this orange section which is the alpha 2 domain. And then you have the external domain 3 which is coding for the alpha 3 domain. These domains are variously referred to as the N domain, the C 1 domain and C 2 domain in humans. As I told you earlier that the beta 2, beta 2 microglobulin comes from a different gene. Then you have the transmembrane domain coding for this transmembrane section. And then you have the cytoplasmic domain and an untranslated 3 prime region. And these are the various amino acids represented over here, the numbers that are represented over here to define the uh, different domains over here. So, 91, 183, 275, 315 to 326 is actually the transmembrane domain and then you have the 39, 339 to 346 representing the 
cytoplasmic domain. So, you will see here that when you look at these alpha helices, we have represented this particular uh, distance between th these two alpha helices as a peptide binding cleft. If you were to re uh, remind yourself of the lecture number 3, where we looked at T cell activation in response to uh, various antigen presenting cells or macrophages, we will remember that these macrophages actually took up the antigen either by endocytosis or by phagocytosis and they would proteolize them within the lysosomal compartment and they would bring them back onto the cell surface, which would then activate uh, T cells to proliferate. So, it was known earlier that this sort of proteolytic uh, processing of the antigen had to occur before T cells could be activated and proliferation could result in a mixture of T cells that would recognize a particular antigen from uh, a mouse that would that was that was immunized with the same antigen. So, these sequences were actually compared from different molecules of MHC and this was done not only for MHC molecules, but in the beginning they were done for immunoglobulin molecules to look at how the variable regions were variable. So, you had a variability plot that was actually designed by Wu and Kabat, a famous immunologist who looked at the immunoglobulin structure and they defined the variability as being the number of different amino acids at a given position divided by the frequency of the most common amino acid at that position. So, you had the they looked at uh, several protein molecules, many, many of them and then looked at the number of different amino acids at a particular position and you divide that by the frequency of the most common amino acid at that position. This denominator being the number of times the most common amino acid occurred divided by the total number of proteins that were examined because the immunoglobulins that were being generated and being purified in those experiments were so many, they could have a very uh, a kind of an overall view of how these immunoglobulins varied in their variable locus or that was, that was how they, they found out that a particular region in the immunoglobulin molecule was actually very, very variable and therefore, they were termed as variable regions as opposed to the constant regions which did not vary so much. Now, the same exercise was done for the MHC molecules and you will find that the surface uh, exposed uh, domains, the alpha 1 and the alpha 2 domain which are external, most external so far as the membrane is concerned, which are the alpha helices over here. These were the ones that were most variable. Now, this is the Wu and Kabat variability plot and this represents the variability over here on, on the x axis on the y axis I am sorry as derived by that formula and the two, the amino acid number or the residue number on the x axis. So, you will see here that the alpha 1 domain had the, the extremely variable nature to it when you looked at the different amino acid residues. Every one of these lines which showed a higher number of variability are the amino acids that were being variable from inbred strain of mouse to inbred strain of mouse. In other words, MHC antigens of different haplotypes or different allotypes would be very different in terms of variability when you compared the primary amino acid sequences. So, the amino acid residues being much more different than the uh, alpha 2, especially compared to the alpha 3, which was not surface exposed, but closer to the membrane had the variability much less than those of the alpha 1 and alpha 2. The alpha 1 being represented over here in this graph, the alpha 2 being represented over here in this graph. 
and therefore, this gave the clue that in fact, just like immunoglobulin molecules, these two domains had actually something to do with binding of antigen, because the variable dom the variable residues, the variable domains of immunoglobulin molecules were found or were known at that time to bind to the different antigens that the immunoglobulin had to recognize. So, the reason that these particular regions of the alpha 1 and the alpha 2 domain or these regions of the protein had actually something to do with the antigen binding. So, in order to further uh, go into these studies, one has to ask the question how does this uh, MHC antigen ha have primary amino acid sequences that were variable and did they actually have anything to do with antigen binding or in other words ask the question whether the does the, the MHC molecule bind the antigen or its fragments. And this came about because they knew that immune responses and the major hist uh, the skin graft rejections associated with these immune responses are MHC restricted. That means, that these immune cells always recognized self. So, the antigen had to be recognized with the self MHC molecule. And as I told you earlier, that this recognition of antigen or the final result of T cell proliferation had to do with something that involved the proteolytic fragmentation of the antigen that was endocytosed by antigen presenting cells or macrophages. So, in other words it needed a processing of the particular antigen in question as opposed to an immunoglobulin molecule which would recognize free floating antigen or unprocessed antigen. So, if you mixed a purified protein molecule with the specific antibodies that were generated to it in a test tube, they would combine and make a complex. In fact, you will remember that this complex was what was precipitated as a immunoprecipitated, which resulted in the classical antigen antibody precipitation curve. Now, as opposed to this, it would mean that the T cell could see the antigen not in its free floating form, but had to be proteolized and this proteolized fragment had to be associated with the self molecule in some fashion in order for it to be recognized by T cells, because the whole purified antigen in question could not stimulate T cells to proliferate, but they could stimulate T cells to proliferate only after it was exposed to antigen presenting cells and these antigen presenting cells had to be present along with the T cells that they, they could stimulate. So, in other words T cells and antigen presenting cells as well as the antigen had to be present in the same tube in order for the T cells to proliferate. So, to ask to understand this question about MHC antigen uh, binding uh, MHC antigen you see the confusion between MHC antigen and an antigen that is going to bind. So, therefore, this sort of nomenclature or terminology one has to be clear that MHC 1 is referred to as an MHC antigen, because it itself was used as an antigen in previous experiments involving cross immunization. So, let us say that the MHC molecule has to bind to a fragmented antigen, how was it demonstrated. In order for to understand this, one has to understand certain events in immunological history to um, which, which found out that these inbred strains of mice were being used not only to generate antibodies, but they were also used to see how T cells could proliferate after immunizing with a particular antigen. In other words, one, one would immunize a, a series of inbred strains of mice, that means these inbred strains of uh, mice expressing different MHC antigens were immunized with a, a model antigens like for example, uh, henna glycozyme or other types of um, antigens. This henna glycozyme was then uh, being added on into a, a culture tube, which would have the self uh, uh, antigen presenting cells 
uh, derived from the same inbred strains of mice that were being immunized as well as the T cells that had already been activated from the same inbred strains. And it was then that they found out that if one added um, a different antigen present antigen presenting cell that were that was derived from a different inbred strains of mice, it could not present the same antigen to the T cell that were that were derived from a uh, from a particular inbred strain of mice. So, so the importance of the self molecule. So, in these experiments they found that in certain in certain um, uh, strains of mice, they found that the immunogenicity and the antigenicity correlated and these were specific strains of mice. In other words, what they were doing is to take a, uh, take an antigen which was let us say had a had a structure as a primary amino acid sequence. So, they, they took this whole antigen or whole hen egg lysozyme and immunized it into, into inbred strains of mice including H 2 K as well as H 2 D. Then they fragmented this lysozyme by proteases. In other words, take, take, take protein fragments which were shorter and shorter in size. And they immunize the same strain of mouse with these shortened fragments and they found that there was a correlation when they put these shortened strains shortened fragments of uh, fragment of Henneg lysozyme or the proteolytic fragments of Henneg lysozyme would correlate with its immunogenicity in terms of T cell activation when the self self antigen presenting cells uh, cells were present. So, in other words they had a particular fragment called as a HEL stands for Henneg lysozyme. Henneg lysozyme 46 to 61 was a minimal fragment which they could use not only to immunize mice to generate antibodies and uh, result in the activation or proliferation of T, of T cells, but they could also be used as an antigen that would bind to antibodies. So, apart from this another event that one has to know was they had generated T cell hybridomas. Now, what are T cell hybridomas? T cell hybridomas or T cells that were specific or they would proliferate in response to a particular antigenic fragment being presented by the self MHC molecule. So, in other words T cell hybridomas derived from H 2 K strain would proliferate in response to that particular HEL uh, fragment or Henneg lysozyme fragment and in this case 46 to 61 that was being presented along with H 2 K antigen. So, these T cells were cloned. So, a clone of cells or uh, they would be the same having the same uh, 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 type of uh, genes and therefore, having the same uh, structure in terms of the receptor that would recognize the antigen which is called as the T cell receptor. So, these clones were then made immortal and that is why it is called as the hybridoma by using certain immortal uh, cell lines called as BW5147 which we will not go into uh, into this class just like suffice it to say similar to the generation of antibody secreting hybridomas, these T cell hybridomas had the ability to recognize HEL 46 to 61 in association with the self restricting MHC molecule and in this case being the H 2 K. So, one had a reagent here in order to find out whether these T cell clones would proliferate in response to the processing and presentation of this HEL 46 to 61 by H 2 K antigen presenting cells. And this activation of T cells which results in proliferation could be uh, assayed by the thymidine, uh, thymidine uh, incorporation experiment or for that matter by another more sensitive event called as the IL 2 uh, release or the secretion of the lymphokine IL 2 which happens during the T cell activation studies. So, in other words T cells T cell hybridomas when they recognize the their specific antigen they would 
release I L 2 into the medium which could then be quantitated. So, summarize it to say for now that these inbred strains of mice that is the generation of inbred strains of mice the congenic resistant which which was a difference only at the H 2 uh, locus and the strains of mice which differed within the MHC complex resulted in a series of experiments giving knowledge about how the, the how the self antigen was represented by the MHC antigen which came in two types called as the MHC 1 as well as the MHC 2 and that this MHC molecules had something to do with the binding of the antigen because they were the they were the antigens that were that had to be present during the processing and presentation or the T cell act or the consequent T cell activation uh, during this whole reaction process or immune reaction process. So, in the next class what we will do is to look at how this immunogenicity and peptide antigenicity helped to uh, demonstrate by experiments involving equilibrium dialysis and purified class 2 MHC molecules, how these experiments could demonstrate the binding of the antigen by the MHC 2 molecules. And then we would go on to look at some more interesting properties of the MHC molecules and from there on to the T cell receptor. Thank you very much.